You are listening to the Thoughts from a Page podcast, which is a member of the Evergreen Podcasts Network. My name is Cindy Burnett, and I love to talk about books with anyone and everyone. While listening to my podcast, you will hear author interviews, behind-the-scenes conversations about various aspects of the publishing world, theme discussions with other book lovers, and more. For more book recommendations and a complete list of all of my interviews, check out my website, thoughtsfromapage.com, and follow me on Facebook and Instagram at Thoughts From a Page. In 2022, I would love for you to join my Patreon group. I offer at least three bonus episodes a month. There is a Facebook group where we all chat books, and we are currently reading advanced copies of books and chatting with the authors pre-publication. I just added another early read for April. We will be reading Linwood Barclay's new fabulous thriller, Take Your Breath Away, and meeting with him on Zoom. Thanks to those that already participate, and I hope you will consider joining us. The Patreon support helps me continue to produce this podcast, and I am very grateful for that. Today, I am chatting with Rebecca Searle about One Italian Summer. Rebecca is the New York Times bestselling author of In Five Years, The Dinner List, and the young adult novels, The Edge of Falling and When You Were Mine. Searle has developed the hit TV adaptation, Famous in Love, based on her YA series of the same name. She is a graduate of USC and the New School and lives in Los Angeles. One Italian Summer is the number one March Indie Next pick, and I thought it was a great read. I hope you enjoy our conversation. And now for a quick break. For the last year, I have been focusing more on my health and eating habits. In connection with that, I have started drinking AG1 in the morning. When I started drinking AG1 daily, I could feel a real difference in my health and energy levels. That is because AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that supports your body's universal needs like gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. Since 2010, AG1 has led the future of foundational nutrition, continuously refining their formula to create a smarter, better way to elevate your baseline health. I recommend AG1 to all of my family and friends because the company has a team of doctors and scientists. It is tested for 950 contaminants and is NSF certified for sport. It is formulated based on the latest science and it maintains high quality standards. Thanks AG1 for sponsoring my show. AG1 is a supplement I trust to provide the support my body needs daily. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash thoughts from a page. That's drinkag, the number one, dot com slash thoughts from a page. Check it out. And now back to my show. Welcome, Rebecca. How are you today? I'm doing so well. I'm so happy to be here with you. I am so happy that you are here because I absolutely have loved all three of your adult books from the dinner list to in five years to one Italian summer. So I am just pleased as punch that you're here to talk with me. Well, thank you so much. And this is actually my first time really sort of in-depthly. Is that a word? In-depthly? In-depth? It works. Talking about one Italian summer. So I'm, I'm, I'm especially excited because I'm, I'm just getting started with that one. So I'm excited and ready to discuss. I bet you are. And as you and I emailed a little bit, this was a bit of a tougher read for me because I lost my mom in September. So I had to put the book down a couple of times only because, you know, it made me sad. But it is such a beautiful book and I just loved it. It made me think of so many positive things about my mom and try to focus on that aspect of it versus her being gone. So I really did appreciate that. I'm so sorry for your loss. I Yes, you're, you're right. We spoke about this a bit. And I'm also really grateful and really glad that the book could provide that for you. Well, the first thing I usually ask authors are to tell me a little bit about the book for those that won't have read it yet. So why don't you tell me the quick synopsis for One Italian Summer? Absolutely. So One Italian Summer is a story of Katie Silver. She is a young woman who has just lost her mother, Carol, and her mother was her best friend in her first phone call. Carol had all the answers. And Carol had always spoken about the summer that she spent in Positano right before she met Katie's father and became a wife and a mom and her whole life changed. And the two of them had this trip planned to go back to Positano together for Carol to show Katie this place that meant so much to her. Carol unfortunately passes away before they can go. And Katie decides to embark on this adventure alone. She decides to go to Italy by herself. And in a magical twist, as is my want, I think readers know now with my books, she ends up meeting her mother when her mother is 30 and they spend the summer together as two young women. Well, that was going to be one of my questions for you was the magical twist part of it. So I'm going to kind of reorder my questions here because 
You do include magical twists and some time travel in a few of your books. So is that something that's always interested you? How did that first come about? Um, you know, something that's really interesting is that when I, so I went to the new school and I got my master's in creative writing. And while I was there, I wrote short stories. I wrote them in college and I wrote them in grad school. And all of my short stories were magical realism. I had a short story about a woman who um, had just gone through a miscarriage. And so she starts living on the ceiling because she can't, she can't like see reality the same way as her husband does. And I guess I was, I was really sort of like moved and inspired by Amy Bender, who was a professor of mine at USC, and these magical realists, a lot of them short story writers. And so I wrote Magical Realism. And then I graduated and I sold my first novel, which was a book called When You Were Mine, which was a modern retelling of Romeo and Juliet from Rosalind's perspective, Romeo's ex. And I started writing contemporary. And I wrote four contemporary young adult novels. And then I had the idea for The Dinner List. And The Dinner List is about um, a woman who shows up to her 30th birthday dinner. And at that dinner, if you could have dinner with any five people living or dead, who would they be? So Audrey Hepburn is at the table and her father who passed away when she was very young. And anyway, so in a lot of ways, magical realism felt like a return to my writing roots. It felt like where I had started that I was like picking back up there. I really like magical realism because I think that it allows you to get to like get inside of an idea in a way that you can't always just operating under our normal rules of time and space. I like to, I mean, I like to explore themes that are very, very human that we all deal with. Like the the main one that I'm really interested in exploring is the dialogue between fate and free will. And I think that shows up a lot in the dinner list and a lot in in five years. But I find that you can sort of like magnify that in a way when you allow for a magical element and their wish fulfillment, their things that I, I think about oh, wouldn't that be interesting if that were possible? Well, I think there are things that a lot of people think if that were possible, what would happen? I think that was the hook for the dinner list. I mean, that's one of those things I've always thought about. And I continue to think about if I could ask five people to dinner or Mm -hmm. 10 people wherever. And, you know, that list changes as you get older. And I think it's interesting to see, okay, maybe 10 years ago, I would have invited these five people. And now I invite these five. And so the idea of that book completely appealed to me. Plus, I love Audrey Hepburn. So I was like, okay, merging two things that I love together. I love that. Yeah. I mean, it was really interesting because we ended up doing, we did uh, a pre-sale tour for that book. And for those folks who don't know that, you go and speak to booksellers, right? And we had, for that particular book, we did dinners with booksellers around the country. And we sort of had this like little running thing where we would ask people at the dinner, if you know, who would be at your dream dinner? And the answers were just so personal. And I think that you, Sabrina, the main character, she really goes through that too. At the beginning, she makes her list. And I think it maybe is more celebrity driven. And as time goes on and she loses people who are close to her, it becomes more about family. Like all the answers were, oh, my mom, because she never got to meet my daughter or my, you know, or my brother. They're all just, it was family. And my grandmother, who I was very close to, passed away over the course of writing that book. So it, it, it is like, it's a very, very personal novel. And it has probably way too many of my 20-something anecdotes in it as well. (laughs) You're like way too autobiographical. Way too. (laughs) Well, and then I think the same thing about in five years. You know, who wouldn't want to look five years or 10 years in the future and see where they were? I mean, I think probably everyone thinks about that. So the second I heard that premise, I was like, she's done it again, a book I must read. And I just can't tell you how much I love that book. I told every person I knew for a solid year. You have to read this book. What have you read that you really loved? I'm like, in five years. And that book did so well. You must have been so pleased. That's so kind. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, it was, It you know, the book came out on March 10th of 2020. And I think we all know what happened next. And it was such a strange thing because I've been publishing for a decade and, you know, I'm, I'm super grateful to still have a career in, in, you know, in publishing and I've gone and done a few things in Hollywood and kind of come back, but I never had a book. Like I never had a New York Times bestseller. I never had a book that, uh, you know, that was, that was like hand passed in the way that in five years was, and it was all happening when nobody could be together. So all of these, I think markers of that kind of quote unquote success, like seeing somebody on the subway, read your book, or seeing somebody at, you know, at a at a resort read your book or, you know, going on a book tour or any of these things, none of them were possible. And so it was this really interesting thing where I knew it was happening, but I couldn't see it. And 
it was also just so magical. I mean, the way in which people pass this book, the way in which people wanted their their friends and their family to read it, the way in which people wanted to talk about it when we couldn't be physically together. It was really, really remarkable because I remember having my tour canceled. I was going on a 14 city book tour and it was canceled on the 12th, two days on my second stop. And I thought, oh my God, this is it. Like this is supposed to be my one. We've all poured so much time and effort and work into this book and it's all going to be for naught. And that is the opposite of what happened. And yeah, I mean, I, I think it will, it will probably go down as, as, one of the most magical things that has ever happened in my career and something I will be eternally grateful for. It's been a really, really, really wonderful two years. And and now I'm excited to get to be back in the world and get to see some people and and talk about this book in real life and talk about One Italian Summer in real life. Absolutely. And so then we get to One Italian Summer and I see the premise and I'm like, oh, but I'm going to read it. And I'm so glad I did. And it's just so wonderful. You just really take these things that everyone wishes they could do and turn them into beautiful stories. And I just think that's remarkable and quite a talent. Thank you so much. And again, thank you for, thank you for reading. I, I had a very, when I, the year I was 23, my three best friends in the span of eight months lost their moms to breast cancer. And I mean, of course, how could it not? It like, it really, it made an impact on me. And the book is in part dedicated to them and their experiences navigating that at such a young age. And I know that like, you know, one of them read it and, and loved it and felt it really cathartic. And, and, you know, one of them said, I just like, I can't, it's too, it feels too personal. And so, uh, which I obviously totally understand. I think it's one of those things that takes time and you just have to feel like you're ready. My next question was going to be, what inspired you to write this book? So your friends losing their mothers, anything else? Like, how did you get started down the road of writing it? Well, okay, two things. One is a little bit lighter, and I'll share that second. The first thing I will say is that I think that I often write about what I'm trying to sort or work out in my own life. So I am extraordinarily close with my mother. I, you know, I think in many ways I have a very similar relationship to her that Katie does with Carol. I I hope it is a little bit more evolved. I think Katie is, is very much reliant on Carol and doesn't yet know that she's a full human being in her own right. And is really um, sort of confused about how to lead her life and make choices for herself in her mother's absence. But I love my mother. I rely on her for a lot of things. And I, my ultimate fear as so many of us is, is losing her. And so I, the things that I'm, trying to sort out the things that I'm afraid of, they often show up in my work because it's a way for me to process what it is I'm going through. And I think in a lot of ways, One Italian Summer is a little bit of a love letter to my future self and what I would want to say and what I maybe would want to have when she's not here anymore. So there's that. But the second part, which is lighter, and I think we'll, 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 we'll cheer us up a bit, which is that in the summer of 2019, I went back to Rome with my mom. And my mom had always, similar to Carol, had always spoken about Rome and Positano as this place she went when she was 20. She fell in love with this man named Ramo, and she had this like really beautiful three-month summer. And we actually were able to find Ramo. We like found his sister on Facebook, and then we found him, and they met at the Trevi Fountain, which was the place that they had met 50 years beforehand. Oh my gosh. And I, by the way, I should caveat this by saying, I always forget this part, that my mom is very happily married to my father. And and this whole thing actually took place on his birthday. And he was very excited about it because <laughs> that's the kind of wonderful marriage that they have. So we, we met Ramo and I saw my mom as this young girl. Like I saw her as somebody that I had never known before. And I thought, oh, that's so interesting. How many people get to have this experience? Like she was sort of like nervous and timid and girlish. My mom is none of those things, but she is, right? Like the girl inside of her is. And so I thought, oh, wow, this is so, what a unique and interesting experience to have with your mother. And it got me thinking about what if you could, like, yeah, what if you could know the person that she was before you existed? What would that be like? Right, because all you ever know, of course, is your mother after she's had you. And so I've always thought about that. What would it be like to go back and see my mom younger, my dad younger, even my grandparents that I was close to? Like, it would be so wonderful to go back and see them 
long before I was around. Yes. And one of my one of my girlfriends who who lost her mother, I remember right after she passed her saying to me, you know, I miss all of her. Like I miss her as my mom, but I also miss her, you know, I miss her at 80 and the women that I will never get to know, but I also miss her at like 10 and 15. And I'm realizing all of the people that she was, not just this one singular mother that I knew. And and something about that always stuck inside my brain and I, I think became the seed of this book in a lot of ways. Well, what probably happened to your friend is what happened to me and that so many people came and told me stories about my mom. Mm-hmm. Many stories I knew, but many I didn't from when she was younger or when her mother was still around and had helped out some of the other people that were my mom's friends at the time in high school, just various things that I didn't know. So you sort of gain this access to the person, you know, like we're talking about, the person that she was long before I was around. Yes, that's so beautiful. I absolutely think that that's true. So what about Katie? Who inspired her? Hmm. Well, Katie is somebody who I think, you know, like I was saying before, I relate to her a lot. I would like to think that I am hopefully farther along than she is. Katie is somebody who has kind of a narrow, narrow view on life. I think that she also doesn't really know exactly what she wants. She believes that her choices are all inherited, that she sort of has a life that's been by design, but maybe not her own. You know, Danny in In Five Years was such a headstrong character, and she was a woman who knew exactly what she wanted, you know, to her own detriment. She thought she could plan life, and you can't. And I think Katie is somebody who just says, I don't know, I've just sort of shown up and other people have done it for me. And her journey over the course of the book is to understand that she, in fact, has consciously chosen a lot of what's in her life, that it wasn't her mom, it was her, and that also she's a sovereign person. And now she has to learn how to be that and how to how to live that way in this world for herself without her mom. So I think it, in a lot of ways, it's, it's honestly a little bit more of a coming of age story than I've written before. I think that's right. And she's just learning how to make sure she trusts herself and rely on the choices that she makes. Yes. Yes. She's She's young in a lot of ways, even though she is further along than I think any of the characters I've written before, she's married. Sabrina and Danny were not. She's, you know, she's a grown up. She owns a house. She's made all of these really big life decisions, but she is emotionally younger when we meet her. I think that's right. I hadn't really thought about it, but I think that's exactly right. Do you have a favorite of the three adult books? <laughs> it's such a good question. And I, 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 I'm not, I'm not laughing, you know, it's a hard question. And also it's not, I will, I'll, I'll walk you through it. I think I'm always most fond of the book that I'm currently talking about. So right now that's one Italian summer because it's the freshest and it's the thing that I'm maybe most like energetically engaged with. The dinner list is, I think if we had to put favorite, I might say that because I think in a lot of ways it's my most personal book, although they all are. All of these books are so personal. (laughs) They all have so much of my own experience in them. But the dinner list was really uh, sort of a collapsing of my like my whole decade from 20 to 30 in New York City. And and I also think that book is a little bit of an underdog. It's not as recognized as in five years and less people have read it. So I think in that way, I'm a little bit attached to it. And I also think that I have probably the most in common with Sabrina than I do of any of these three protagonists. I would say I'm, I, by the way, I don't think that's a particularly flattering portrayal of me, but, but I would say I probably have the most in common with Sabrina than I do with Danny or with Katie. So in a lot of ways, I'm very attached to the dinner list. And also it was my, it was my debut into adult. It was just a very career changing book in that way for me. In five years, I love because it was the book that changed my life. And also because Female friendship is so fundamentally important in my life. And that book is such a, uh, like a monument to the relationships in my life. So I love them all, but I'm most fond of One Italian Summer right now. And I also think that that book, The Dinner List and In Five Years are quite heavy in some ways. And I think One Italian Summer is not light, as we've been discussing. I mean, it's about a young woman who's lost her mom, but it's also, it is lighter than the other two because. I like to say that In Five Years is sort of the stars at night and One a Time Summer is the sun at high noon. It is a book that emotionally, energetically, and also physically in a lot of ways takes place in the daylight. 
And I feel like that book is being born into the right time. I feel like that's what I want to read right now. Well, and as we're coming out of the pandemic, fingers crossed, it's such a joyful, happy book and traveling somewhere, being in Italy, all of that. Yes, yes. There's lots of pasta and wine, if that that matters to anyone. Celebratory, right? (laughs) So format of this book. I am spoiler free and definitely with your book, I don't want there to be any spoilers because I think it would very much ruin it for the reader. But did you always have in mind the format that you used and the resolution of the story? Yes. I'm not a big plotter. I don't go through an outline books. To me, part of the magic of writing is that it, sometimes it feels like reading. And I like to have that. I don't really know how I would go about writing if I didn't have that. But yes, with this one, I understood what the large emotional trajectory would be. And I, I that, that was true of The Dinner List and that was true of In Five Years as well. I knew what the big beats were going to be. And I had... Actually, okay, here's the interesting thing. I knew, I always know what the big beats are going to be. And I have a sense of, of what the emotional resolution is. But on this one, and, and again, we'll, you know, we'll have a spoiler free discussion, but there are sort of two ways that, that the ending could have gone. And I wasn't entirely sure what that was going to look like for Katie until pretty far down the road, actually, on this one. I didn't know. And I remember having a conversation with a few of my writer friends being like, I'm not, like, I'm not sure what it, like, which way is this meant to go? Which, like, there's a lesson here and there's a lesson here and which lesson belongs in this book. And eventually you just find it. It's the thing that hits. It's the thing that in your gut, in your stomach feels like, oh yeah, this is what the book is. But I didn't know that at the, at the start. Well, one of the things that I think is so interesting about reading one of your books is that the entire time I'm reading, I'm like, where is this going to end up? How is this going to end? Because there's always something a little different going on with the magical realism. So you know there has to be some resolution. And so it's always fascinating to me as I'm reading, I'm trying to plot it out and guess and like what's going to happen. And I never guess the right way. Well, that makes me very happy. I'm not a very good plotter, but uh, but like people do tend to say that they don't see surprises coming, which makes me very happy. I think that if I can hide the magic, then I've done a good job. I think that you, you, you know, I want to introduce it. It's obviously a part of the book, but I ultimately this book is meant to exist in the real world. Ultimately, she's having the summer with her mom. And so I don't want the reader thinking in every moment, oh, this is, you know, this is magic. This is magic. This is magic. It should just, it, it's a real human story and it should feel that way. So my goal is always to introduce it, to not make a big fuss about it, and then to just let the book play out. And I think that's what works so well, because I'm not really a big magical person, but I don't think your books are big magical at all. I mean, I think it's just there's usually the kind of the one element or some portion of it that, as you said, kind of adds a really fun element to the story, but it's not like everything around is full of magic and things like that. Yes. No, no. It's only the one element that is magical. And, and then hopefully you forget that that element is even magical. Exactly. And you really just read the story and you're not thinking about the magic at all. And I think part of that also is kind of what I was talking about earlier. I think the things that you choose to write about and to do are things that people think about regularly. So it's not even like it's really magic. It's more like, I wish I could go five years in time and see what was happening to me, or I wish I could meet my mom when she was young. So I think it's things that that we all have in our brains already. You're just turning them into a story. Yes. It's a concrete what if, for lack of a better way to put it. Yes. I think that's a good way to frame it. Well, what about who was the easiest to write and who was the hardest to write in this one? I think Katie was the hardest to write because she's not a person who has a very clear point of view when we meet her. And that's challenging, especially when you're writing a first person narrative. So, you know, I I keep comparing her to to Danny from In Five Years, but Danny, when we meet her, is like she just comes like bolting out out of the gate. She's like, here's who I am. Here's what I want. Here's how I'm going to get it. We know it all up front. We get who she is. But Katie is not somebody who has, you know, as we were discussing before, she doesn't have a very clear identity. She doesn't really have a clear sense of self when we meet her. And so that was really challenging to convey, especially at the beginning. How do you get to know a character who doesn't really know herself? And I, you know, I'm hopeful that as the book evolves, you know, we become more and more endeared to her in a way. But that was very, I will say, like, that was very challenging. So I'd say Katie was probably the hardest to write. Carol was the easiest to write. And I say Carol to mean the 30-year-old version of Carol. 
I really loved being able to create this sort of thorough thread, but at the same time, dichotomy between Carol at 30 and, and the sort of flashbacks that we get of Katie's mom, Carol, and how those two characters are very different, but also speak to each other. And Carol was just like so full of life and so joyful and so, yeah, just just in a lot of ways so different from Katie. So I had a lot of fun with her. I bet. I was figuring Carol might have been the easiest to write. Yeah. Yeah. She was really, she was really joyful and, and really fun. Well, what about your title and your cover? I'm always fascinated with both because I don't think people realize how much effort goes into either one of them and how important they both are. I absolutely loved our cover for In Five Years. And we, I mean, we must have gone through, I'm not exaggerating, 400 covers. We looked at so many different images and none of them were it. And then and we have an incredible design team at Simon & Schuster. I'm very, very grateful for it. They all work so hard. And we finally hit on the right thing for In Five Years. And I loved it. And I thought, think that cover is so beautiful. And so when we approached One Italian Summer, we knew we wanted to do sort of that same watercolor feel, that font, that like really, that sort of like beautiful handwriting that we had for In Five Years, we wanted to do again for One Italian Summer. And then I think, you know, to my point about In Five Years being night and One Italian Summer being day, I think the idea was to just like overlay the that iconic Bay of Positano for the New York City skyline, which is on the In Five Years cover, and and have the book just scream have an Aperol spritz with us. <laughs> <laughs> but also I think they tie together pretty well, those two covers. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. It was very pretty. There were, there were a lot of, I, I'm I'm terrible with the internet. I'm a total Luddite, which I know you're like not really allowed to be anymore, but I am. And But there were a lot of like cross comparisons. I don't know, I'm not saying this right, but like photo image. Chat, there, there was a lot of, of laying multiple covers and multiple aspects of covers side by side to in five years and seeing, okay, what exactly looks the best here? And I really think we hit it. I I absolutely love this cover. I think you did too. And I love it too. And I think it's wonderful that publishers are really focusing on that now, making kind of a cover brand for an author so that even though the covers don't look exactly alike, you put them together and they coordinate so well. Yeah. I'm somebody who loves a design bookshelf. So that makes me really happy in authors I love that I can have, you know, a set. And also I think for just recognition, if, if, if you're in a bookstore and you're sort of, I'll do a lot of book browsing when I'm at the airport, like at Book Soup at LAX is where I often buy a lot of books because I fly United often and they have a Book Soup in the terminal. And so I'll go. And if I'm, you know, if I'm running or I'm late or something, it's really nice to see a cover and be like, oh, I know who that is. You know, I know, I like I, I can recognize that that's that author's thing. And so it's an, just an easy way for me to get what it is I'm looking for. I agree completely. Well, what about what you're working on next? Have you thought about that yet? Or are you just busy getting One Italian Summer out into the world? I am very busy getting One Italian Summer out into the world. And that is my main focus and will be for probably quite some time. But yes, I am working on a new book that I really, really love and I'm really excited about it. I actually wrote the first draft last year. So there will be more coming. And yes, this book is this book is different. I mean, it's it's similar and it's not. And I actually will say, I know we spoke earlier and I said the dinner list is my most personal. I would say probably this next novel actually is going to replace that. Well, that's exciting. I can't wait for it to make its way out into the world. Me too. Me too. I love this. I just, I feel so incredibly lucky to have the job that I do and get to publish in this space and that people want to read these books. It really, it's so wonderful. Well, what have you read recently that you really liked? Okay, my really dear friend, Jen Smith, has a book, actually her adult debut. She, like me, wrote a lot of YA, and now she has an adult coming out, and it's called The Unsinkable Greta James, and it comes out the same day as One Italian Summer, actually. And I absolutely loved it, absolutely loved it. It was one of my favorite books I read last year. I also really, and I've been chatting about this on social media, I loved Kevin Wilson's Nothing to See Here, delightful, also magical realism, and really also one of my favorite books that I read last year. It's so quirky and strange and really different, which I love in a novel. I recently read the plot. I don't read thrillers ever. And my dad handed me this book and said, oh, this is about academia and writers and which are two, like, that's my favorite genre. So I was like, oh, great. And then it turned out it's this, it's this wild thriller, but it's really incredible. I'm like a scaredy cat and I can't read thrillers, but I love the plot. 
And I say this all the time. I think I'm like constantly trolling her because I'm desperate for her to write a new book. But uh, The Love Affairs and Nathaniel P by Adele Waldman is really like honestly my favorite book of the last 15 years. I love it so much. It's such a wonderful character study. It's so brilliant. She's such a brilliant writer. I know she does a lot of journalism and she does a lot for for the Times and, and various things. But Adele, please write a new book. I don't even know that one. I'm going to have to go look it up. It's so good. It's so, I'm like, yeah, I'm like, I'm like, like she probably thinks I'm a total stalker. I talk about her all the time. <laughs> well, The Unsinkable Greta James was amazing. I read it a while ago and I just thought it was so good. Absolutely a delay. I'm really excited to watch that book soar. Yeah, me too. Well, Rebecca, thank you so much. This has been a true joy. And I cannot tell you how excited I was to get to talk to you about not only One Italian Summer, but the dinner list and in five years as well. So thanks for taking the time to come on the Thoughts from a Page podcast. Thank you so much. This was so, so, so fun. Thanks for having me on. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. If you liked this episode, and I hope you did, please follow me on Instagram at Thoughts from a Page. Consider joining my Patreon group to access bonus content and support the podcast. Tell all of your friends about the podcast and rate it or subscribe to it wherever you listen to your podcasts. I would really appreciate it. The book discussed in this episode can be purchased at mybookshop.org storefront and the link is in the show notes. I hope you'll tune in next time. I'm Allison Holland, host of the Kennedy Dynasty podcast. Equipped with a microphone and a long-term fascination of the Kennedy family, I am joined by an incredible cast of experts, friends, and guests to take you on a fun, relaxed, yet informative journey through history and pop culture. From book references to fashion to philanthropy to our modern expectations of the presidency itself, you'll see that there is so much more to Kennedy than just JFK or conspiracy theories. Join me for the Kennedy Dynasty podcast.